Okay. All right. So let's do that. Whenever you're ready. Is my audio good for you? I got my little snowball mic here for you just Snowball in case. is kicking ass and taking names. Yes, it's All good. Right, good. Yes. Good deal. So whenever you're ready, go ahead and do it. Okay. This is Kyle Duford from thebrandleader.com, and you are listening to Vroom Vroom Veer, whatever the hell that means, with Jeff Smith. <laughs> perfect. Is that right? Yes. Right. No, that's perfect. Right. <laughs> whatever the hell that means. <laughs> Most people are thinking that anyway. <laughs> All right. Thank you. All right. I'm going to yeah, no stop. Worries. I'll be right back. Are you ready to thoughtfully steer away from your revved up, frenzied, and far too often scripted life? Then welcome to Vroom Vroom Veer with Jeff Smith, where he guides you down the road differently traveled by sharing unique experiences with guests who have managed to shift away from a life stuck on cruise control and veered their way into a more authentic and fulfilling one in all sorts of interesting and kind of remarkable ways. Get ready to Vroom Vroom Veer with your differently traveled road chauffeur, Jeff Smith. Curtis, thank you so much for being on Vroom Vroom Veer, and welcome to the show. How's it going, man? Great, great. Thanks for having me, Jeff. I'm excited to be here and chat with you and your audience today. I appreciate you being here. So talk a little bit about what you're most excited about in your business over there at richcurtis.com today. Yeah, well, I'm on a mission to change as many lives as possible, one story at a time. So what I get most excited about is, uh, you know, getting getting one on one with a client and getting them to work through their story so they can break free and get moving back on. So most of the people that come to me are stuck in some way. Right. And uh, I help them find that story that's got them stuck. I help them rewrite it and then they can just put the pedal down and get moving again. And that uh, that fires me up. It's that, that, break, that breakthrough moment of rewriting that story that's had you stuck forever and you didn't even realize it. That's, awesome. um, that, that's what I'm always most excited about in my business good job man good good business good idea yeah i'm all in (laughs) (laughs) i wish you were around when i was uh stuck and frustrated (laughs) i'm better now yay yeah that's what we want there you go so let's talk a little bit about you um growing up so where did you grow up I grew up in San Jose, California. Um, so, uh, I was in the, it's a big city, you yeah. know, but, uh, but I was in the burbs, um, okay. you know, and, uh, I'm the youngest of, uh, of five kids. So big, big family, uh, wow. five. Yes, it was a wild time. And we were the first sort of, uh, you know, first of a big family that moved to the West coast. So even though there was only five plus my parents very quickly, my grandmother moved in and then all the aunts and uncles and everybody who moved from the East coast to the West coast lived with us for a while. So, wow. so you were the, the sort of like maiden head of the family migration to the West coast. Yeah. Anywhere from <laughs> not nine to 14 people uh, living in my house at, at one time. Wow. Uh, growing up. So it was, it, it was crazy. wild. That's like a TV <laughs> show right there. Yeah. Yeah. It felt like it. <laughs> Just fighting to get the bathroom. I bet you only had one. Right. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All, all my brothers are over, over six foot and big, huge men. And I'm, I'm five, uh, you know, 10. And I always joke that uh, I was just fighting to get enough calories to, to, to get, and I didn't get enough to get the height. <laughs> yeah, I get it. I was the youngest of three. So, we're we're equally damaged. <laughs> <laughs> that's 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 right. Yeah, yeah. But but we but we got the uh, the gregariousness of the youngest child. You know the correct. The, the <laughs> yeah, the youngest child always comes out just aching for attention, right? <laughs> yeah, I think so. Yeah, that's that's what we were. Anyway, we could digress and go into a therapy <laughs> session, but let's move on. <laughs> so, did you go to college? Uh, yeah, I, I went to college at uh, UC Santa Cruz, got a degree nice. in environmental studies, um, okay. uh, uh, of all things. And then uh, I, I basically, after college, I just spent over a decade as a raft and a mountain guide. So I uh, lived in the back wow. of my truck, <laughs> made like $8,000 a year uh, and had, you know, 100 nights in a sleeping bag uh, every Damn. year at least. And yeah. Uh, had a blast. So I told you I retired in my, my 20s and then I started paying for it in my 30s and 40s. So <laughs> uh, after that, I became a real estate entrepreneur and then um, okay. eventually on to the, uh, to the coaching and speaking and writing work I do now. Wow. Let's talk a little because that sound, it sounds like you could have been on uh, American Ninja Warrior. <laughs> uh, no, I, uh, had you been I was, a rock climber, right? <laughs> I, I was actually, yeah, I was an avid rock climber for really? a long, long time. Yeah. Wow. But, uh, 
but I was never in good enough shape. Those, those people are absolute beasts. Uh, shape, yeah. Right uh, so I, I, I would have failed miserably on that show. <laughs> work out. It's crazy. Just, just imagining the, the, what you have to do to have that kind of grip strength. Oh yeah. It blows yeah, my yeah. mind. You know, I, I try to get grip strength and I can't open pickle jars. <laughs> 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 i know the trick you have to smack the bottom but anyway okay so how did you figure out this whole gig of like there's a story in your head that's holding me back how what what's the superhero origin story of the idea of there's a story in your head and you're you're kind of like listening to it and then that is it's got like some sort of hold on you you're stuck how did you find that? Yeah, I think it's it's going to end up being a far less glamorous story than a superhero origin story. That's so, okay. <laughs> but uh, yeah, about in uh, in 2013, um, my mom suddenly died um, suddenly and unexpectedly and very quickly, um, wow. and that that threw she me was into. Young, I guess. Young yeah, kid. she was 68 at the time. Okay. Yeah. Um, and we, we, we took her into the hospital thinking she had a massive hernia and it turned out to be a massive tumor. And then it, it went very quickly. Wow. Um, yeah, that's sad. and so, yeah, it, it, it was really hard. It threw me into t- two years of, um, you know, d- depression, frustration, and anger. It, it also was 41 days before the birth of my first child. So he, Ugh, he, right. he almost got to meet her, but he didn't. And that, that caused a lot of, uh, pain for me. And so, you fast forward sort of two years down the road from that mark. And, uh, you know, I think some people, they have their epiphanies, like, you know, on the slopes of the Andes, taking ayahuasca, cuddling a yak, you know, <laughs> staring at the stars, right. um, right. you know, or, or with, with maybe with their pastor or, you know, or, mm-hmm. or meditating, but no, at I was, I was, the movies they do. yeah, right. <laughs> uh, I, I was circling a Costco parking lot, um, screaming into my phone, having a fight with my older brother, which, okay. Uh, all right. So I told you I'm the youngest of, of five and, and we were, we were an Irish Italian family. So, um, screaming in arguments is in our DNA. Um, and, and so he had just moved to California, um, after being gone for 20 years and I wasn't spending as much time with him as he would like, uh, basically because I was in this state of suffering from our mom's death. Right. And so we're, right. we're having this argument. And in the middle of the argument, I just screamed into the phone I'm failing you. I'm failing Anne. That's my wife. Um, and we failed mom. We just stood there and watched her die. She fought for all five of us every day of her life. And we just stood there and watched her die. Uh, and wow. I, I, I hit the brakes on my truck. Uh, and in fact, the little, uh, security guard got unbeknownst to me, somebody had called in the lunatic circling Costco screaming on his phone. So <laughs> the, the little security guard guy in his golf cart almost slammed into the back of my tundra when I hit the brakes. Wow. Uh, so he was but- following you. He was, yeah, it was, it was surveilling I think, you a little. I think he was trying to flag me down. Yeah. But I was okay. so in the moment that I, I didn't, he wasn't even in my world at that time. Right. Um, but, uh, I was just so stunned that that story was inside me, right? That is, that's a story that I had never, uh, said out loud, never heard, uh, never engaged with in any, in any way, even, you know, late at night on the couch with a whiskey, feeling sorry for myself. I'd never knew that story was in there. And, and there it was, I, I spit it out in this argument. And, and I knew instantly that was the source of all of the pain and suffering I've been going through for the last two years. Right. And I was, and I was so shocked that I had that story in me and didn't know it. Uh, yeah. and it, it wasn't part of my conscious uh, reality. Right. And, right. and so that moment, that epiphany, um, led me to a few things. It, it made me ask a couple of questions and I, I believe our lives, the quality of our lives is directly proportional to the questions we ask ourselves and the totally. stories we tell ourselves. Totally. So I asked myself, is this true? Um, and then I asked myself an even better question, even if it's true, does it serve me? Right, um, right, right. And so on the, is this true you know, front, I went back through the day my mom died. And so um, I told you we'd taken her in for hernia and, uh, and found out it was cancer, but they had sent her home and said, hey, in a couple of months, we'll talk about treatments for this. So nobody felt like there was anything imminent. And then three days later, um, Boom. She were at four in the morning. We were taking her to the hospital. Um, and she spent the next 12 hours um going through the dying process. And so um I I looked at that day and thought through each of the moments. And so my mom had a DNR, a do not resuscitate order. Okay. Um, which if you don't know what that is, it basically means if we're all sure this is only going one way, then you need to stop working on me and let me go. Right, right. Um and so, and I, 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 when I was a raft guide, uh, you know, I've, I've dealt with plenty of people with these and I know, I know what that means. Uh, you know, I know, I know what the outcome of the day is going to be if you have that piece of paper in place. 
Um, and I also right. sort of had some bad stories carrying over from those rap guy days, sort of these masculine, like nobody dies on my watch. Right. And, and, sure. and they were reinforced by that having not happened, you know, having, having had a lot of injuries and, um, and things and, and having people, you know, survive. Goals. Right. Okay. Yeah. And so, uh, I brought that DNR in at four in the morning and I asked my mom to rescind it and she wouldn't, um, you know, cause you can verbally rescind it. And so I handed it over to the doctor, even though I knew what that meant. And then, uh, my mom was a devout Catholic. We raised Catholic. I'm, I am not, uh, but you know, we, uh, once we knew what was happening, we got the priest into the final sacrament for her. Right. Um, and then, you know, later in the day, um, you know, my dad, uh, they, my mom and dad had a tremendous relationship. Uh, they would have been married, I think 50 years, um, just, a, a uh, a couple months after she died. Um, and, and my dad, uh, he couldn't get to her. The hospital bed was in the way, uh, and I couldn't figure out the rail. So I got the nurse over there, got her to bring the, the bed rail down. So my dad could get into bed and, and cuddle her and comfort her. And then my dad had said to me, look, look at her eyes. The mask is freaking her out. She doesn't like stuff on her face. So I went to the to the nurse again and said, what's that mask doing? She said, it'll, it'll extend her life by five to 10 minutes. So I said, get that off her face. You know, we, we don't need those five to 10 minutes. Like, get, you know, get her, get her comfortable. So I went back to that day and looked at all the ways I supported my mom in the dying process. You know, the largest of which was just standing there in, in the final moments. If you've never been through this, if you've never stood with someone at the moment of their death, it's uh, it's excruciating. And, and maybe maybe other people have a different reaction, but I wanted to run from it. I wanted to, I wanted to leave. I wanted to run. I wanted to hide. I wanted to not experience this. Uh, but I didn't, I stood there with my hand on her leg, with my eyes trained on her eyes. And I went through that process with her. So she knew I was there right up until the end. Right. And so wow. I, was, I was able to look at that day and say, look, I actually fought for my mom in every way I could while respecting her right to die her way. Right. Um, right. She was a she was a, a a short, stout, stubborn Irish woman, and she never did anything in her life uh, that she didn't want to do, and she did everything her way right up until right up that. The end. Yeah. 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 And so when you look at those two, yeah. when you look at those two stories, they're both true, right? We 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 just stood there and watched mom die. We didn't fight for her, and I fought for my mom in every way I could while respecting her right to die her way. Those are two equally true stories. One of those stories w was literally killing me, uh, and and the other one sets me free, and the other one. Um, serves me and allows me to um, have a sense of peace and calm about the day of my mom's death. So w when you're thinking about your internal narrative, th this is not kind of like a, a hooey wooey, you know, thing. These things are actually creating real physical uh, symptoms of suffering um, and, and real pain in your lives. And you're in charge of it. You wrote both those stories. Now, certainly, you, and we can talk about this, you internalize stories, especially when you're young from other people, but for the most part, you wrote them and you're in control of them. So why are we making up such bad stories for ourselves, right? Like uh, right. You, you'd you'd never stand up at a, at a at a cocktail party and say everybody just wanted you to know I, I did nothing. I just stood there and watched my mom die, just so everybody knows, right? <laughs> right. That's you're not that's doing not, it at a conscious level. Yeah, or, or right. I mean, and and you'd never ever want to be living that story. Like all the things we tell ourselves, like I say, late late at night on the couch with a whiskey. Uh, you, you know, like uh, I, I'm fat. I'm not athletic. I'm no good at anything. I'm never going to amount to anything. I'm not good enough, right? Like nobody's going to stand up at that cocktail party and say, "Hey, everybody, I I totally suck at everything," right? That's <laughs> right. But we'll tell our You're not we'll tell our post that on your Facebook page. <laughs> yeah, I'm not right. going to update my IG right now with that. Uh, <laughs> right. But we tell ourselves that stuff all the time when nobody. Nobody right. is looking. So you're you're in charge of these stories. You're making this stuff up. I, I use a more adult version of that term in the book, but you're making this stuff up um, and, and you're in control. So why are you writing such bad stories for yourself? And the minute you can sort of get to the point where you realize that and you take some agency and you rewrite one of these stories and you feel how that sets you free and you feel the changes that makes in your life, you'll, you'll be hooked. And, and the great part about it is you know, I think so much in the self-help um, industry, people are out there looking for that guru, that person with the solution, that person that will change their lives. And and they forget that that person is them, that that right. everything they need to heal is inside of them. Right. And when you take control of your of your story like this, um, then that's it. You are your own. You are your own healer. You know, may, maybe I need to teach you to do it once, but that's it. Then you don't need me anymore. Right. You're off to the races. It's a muscle you can build. And anytime you struggle with something, you're going to ask yourself, what's my story about this? Is it true? If, even if it's true, is it serving me? And right. with those with those three questions, you can set yourself free from just about anything. That's amazing. Yeah, and I think I've been through this like many, many times. I, I remember there was this. Um, I don't want to get into the gory details, <laughs> but a childhood story, right? That I know for well, first off. The, the sad thing was, was like, I did something bad, right? And I was like really young, 
Okay, like yeah, yeah, I have to guess, but like maybe like five or six, right? And my mom's face was horrified, right? So I was looking, and I I had the identity, you know, I was the youngest, right? That <laughs> I wanted to be like Mama's little angel, right? Like what she thought I was. <laughs> I was trying to live up to her script. Um, yeah, yeah. And when I when I saw that face, I was like, oh, I'm never getting back into Angel Zone, right? <laughs> I'm tainted <laughs> forever, right? Uh, the, and then um, my brother actually held that over me and sort of like uh, brother blackmailed me for my uh, a good chunk of my childhood. Now, I carried that story into adulthood before I rewrote it and was like, look, you were six. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I don't want to get into the whole thing, but I did. I went back, I, I rewrote it as you know. Okay, you're learning. You're not really even knowing what's going on. Oh, by the way, you're human. Right? All these things that I was trying to be perfect. Uh, I horrified my mom. You know, the brother stuff that took a little bit longer to unspin, but we're good now. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I get it. You know, we're we're all going through this. I think, right? I mean, this is not just Rich and Jeff. It's very much a human thing. Yeah, absolutely. And and I very much wanted to confirm that, right? Because you you have these epiphanies in life and 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 you make a major change in your life and then you sort of feel like, oh man, am I onto something or did this just work for me? And so I actually went and and, and spent two years deep diving into the neuroscience of story um, okay. and the neuroscience of uh, uh, wow. uh, and, of happiness, you know, and reading sort of the canon of, of positive psychology and cognitive behavioral therapy and those things to see, am I onto something? Is this, is, is there really a function in our brain that, that works um, to this? And it, and it turns out um, that there very much is. So story affects us in these dramatic and profound ways um, at, at right. the deepest levels of our brain. And there's a, a brilliant uh, researcher, Mary Helen Imardino Yang in Southern California, um, wow. who does research on how inspiring stories affect our brain. So they'll, they'll tell their patients an inspiring story, and then they'll put them in an fMRI machine and see what's going on in the brain. Uh, yeah. and, and one of the things, yeah, yeah it really is. <laughs> I want to, I, I, I want to do that study. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I really want. I got to interview some of her grad students for the book, and uh, and we talked about some additional research, you know, that I'd I'd love to to someday see done, where we take someone suffering from one of these bad stories and do the same, run, run them through the fMRI machine after they've triggered their bad story right. and see what's going on there. But um, what they've found is that when you tell someone an inspiring story, um, there's there's really like uh, three parts of the brain that that light up. Um, you, you know, the, the prefrontal cortex lights up a little bit, uh, and then the insula, um, which is actually two parts of the brain on the left and right, they're responsible for gut function, um, which is really kind of interesting. So when you get gut that like function, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah, when you get that sort of tingling gut feeling from a story, that's because you've actually like turned on the part of your brain responsible for gut function with that story, which is wow. really interesting. That is amazing that they can get that granular with those now. <laughs> yeah, but, but the more amazing wow. part was was the medulla lights up. And so the fact that it's um, lighting up m means two things. One, it's blood getting flow, right? Yep, blood flow and electricity. Okay. Wow. Um, which, which means you've changed your brain essentially at the neural level with that story. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and what's interesting about the medulla is it's the survival center of your brain. It's, it's responsible for such okay. trivial functions as keeping you breathing when you're asleep, keeping your blood pressure up, right? This is your heart beating. You, that sort of your, yeah. Your heart beating. Exactly. If you take a big enough hit to the medulla, they can't even keep you alive on life support for more than 10 to 15 minutes. Wow. Um, and so you'd think evolutionarily we would have built an impenetrable firewall around that part of our brain, right? That's that's the most important. Uh, as you know, it that's turns out not good. so much. <laughs> right. As it turns out, I, as it turns out, I probably reached right into your medulla with the story of my mom today, and and that's that's wild to think about. So if I can tell you an inspiring story, um, or or just an impactful story, and I can light up the the oldest, deepest survival center of your brain. Think about the kind of damage you're doing to yourself with the negative stories that, that you've gotten that you're carrying around. Right. And so um, th these stories really do, uh, you know, impact us deeply and neurologically. And so beyond the the sort of, you know, hooey wooey, uh, <laughs> you know, benefits of, of rewriting your story, there's actually some real psychological benefits um, to taking control of your narrative uh, and moving it forward in, in the right direction. Yeah, it's... 
It's amazing that, you know, I, I know you keep saying it's not hooey wooey, it's science. And you're right, but keep saying that. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> because just the idea of of you know you're telling yourself a story that's holding you back that is it 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 sort of talks a little bit about it sounds like you know now all of a sudden you're on a couch and and I'm a Freudian therapist and you're telling me about your mother right it it's a little bit like that but you're doing it yourself and how it, is there a mechanism that you've discovered? I think the hardest part would be having inducing that uh, that epiphany without driving around um, the Costco parking lot screaming at your brother. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> right. You don't want to have to do that every time. So, in in Rich's book, you have to drive to Costco. You got to do two laps, and you can call my brother. Here's his number. You don't want to do that. Right. I would, although it would it would entertain me to no end to give you all my brother's phone number right now and have you start calling him. That that would that, that would def- that would be awesome. Yes. That would definitely make my day. Um, but no, no, it's it's actually easier and more predictable to figure out. Um, it's it's a really simple formula. I teach it in the book. Um, the first step is just um, thinking about an area of your life you're not happy with. So, because uh, you have stories about literally everything, you have a story yeah. about who you are uh, as a son, as a brother, as a father. Um, as a husband uh, or a right. wife, you know, you, you have stories about who you are as an athlete, as a podcaster, as an entrepreneur, or whatever your job is. Maybe you're a teacher or a firefighter. You have stories about all of those things, and all those stories drive your your outcomes. And, and what's interesting is we're all sort of living and being driven by those without knowing it. It would it would be like you know sitting down in the car in the morning and you turn it on and the GPS comes on. And just starts giving you directions and you just start going and you never stop and look, right? You never stop and look at what the address is or ask whether it's taking you where you want to go. Right. Um, and we're, we're all kind of living that way with these, with these stories that are driving us. We're not shining a light on them and we're not uh, taking the time to decide whether they're taking us where we want to go. So the first thing to do is just to think about an area of your life you're not happy with. Maybe that's, you know, relationships, um, you know, with friends or with your children or with your wife. Maybe that's body image issues. Maybe that's career issues. Um, you know, maybe you're an entrepreneur and you're trying to break barriers, you know, financial barriers, and you're, you're finding yourself unable to do that or a level of success you're trying to reach. So you think about this area of your life that you're not happy with. Any area of your life that you're not happy with, there's not only a story there, but there's a bad story there, one that's not serving you. Right. And so you just ask yourself, what's my story about this? And then try to get that out, get it to come up and write it down. And once you've written it down, you just ask yourself, is this true? And even if it's true, does it serve me? Right. Okay. And, and once it's out, once you've discovered, you've got it out and you've written it down on paper, um, the, the next step I teach people is actually to say it out loud. The first time you ever say it out loud and record yourself, like with your smartphone, set it up, record right, yourself. Because right. you're going to see on your face the parts of that story that don't work. You're going to see the, the, the twinge of pain. You're going to see, uh, you, um, you, you know, you're going to see just a hiccup or a hitch in your uh, physical facial features as you wow. tell the story. And that's going to tell you the parts of the story that are, that are hurting and aren't working for you. Mm. And you can, you can rewatch that and then mark those parts of the story on your page to rewrite them. Um, and then the step three that's is, good. that's pretty good. <laughs> yeah. And you, you just simply mark them out and then you, you do an iterative process of rewriting them. Take the first one you, you marked and rewrite just that part. Don't try to, you know, how to eat an elephant one bite at a time. So don't right. try to rewrite the whole story. Um, just take that one first bit that you marked. So for me, uh, you know, when I was yelling at my brother, you know, I'm failing you and I'm failing Anne, right? That was the first part of the story. So I looked at that and thought, well, you know, maybe I'm not hanging out with my brother as much as he wants or whatnot, but I'm, I'm not failing anybody. Right. So I can just right. delete that. And, and, you know, my wife understands what I'm going through. So I could just, I didn't have to rewrite that part. I could delete it, you know? Right. Um, and then I could look at, you know, the next step and we failed mom. Right. And, and, and the truth was, I really felt that way. I did feel like I'd failed my mom that day. So I went through that process. I told you, looked at the day, looked at all the ways I fought for my mom. And then I was able to rewrite that section. And you just keep rewriting it and then saying it out loud to yourself again until you get to the point where it feels good, it feels right, it feels positive, and it will set you free. Um, and it, it still has to be true. You can't sort of batter away the bad with with senseless positivity. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, uh, an example of that, that. Been there, done yeah. that, yes. Yeah, and I think, I, I think you know, when you take like positive psychology, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of positive psychology, and 
and, and positive psychology has kind of gotten conflated with positive thinking in popular culture. So it's become this sort of just batter away everything with, but positive psychology at its root is just a belief that we gain more out of studying what's right in people than what's wrong, right? right. That we, we gain more out of believing you're, you're a complete whole and healthy individual. And how can we amplify that rather than looking for your pathologies mm -hmm. and problems, you know? Right, right. Um, but, you know, a good example of this is my son, my seven-year-old uh, loves school and distance learning is not his jam. And, and he was really having, <laughs> right. he was really having trouble with it. And he told me one day, dad, I hate school. And I, I did the story evolution process with him that I was just you know, talking about with you. I, I recorded him, you know, telling that story, dad, I hate school. And I let, I let him watch. It. I said, you know, man, does, do you look happy? Do you, does that look like that story is doing good things for you? He said, no, that, I look horrible, dad. And so we we rewrote the story, uh, you know, into one that served him. And at one point I tried to, part of his story was Zoom, you know, his, his eventual new positive story was Zoom sucks, but I still get the opportunity to um, see my friends and teachers and learn, right? And I, I tried to take the Zoom sucks part out and, and then I had him retell it. And then I said, well, does that feel right? He says, no, no, it's not, it's not true. Zoom sucks. And I was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> like you're, 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 you're right. So we okay. put that back in, you know, so zoom sucks. He's acknowledging the negative. He's not battering away or pretending. And then, then he, you know, gave it a counterbalance point with the, but I still get to see my, you know, teachers, friends and learn you know, part. And then, you know, he was just completely changed all the, all the distance learning battles and, and, and stuff we've been dealing with for the first several months were gone. He was living out this, this new story. Um, but he didn't let, I, I almost fell into the trap there of trying to, you know, batter away the negative, um, rather than, you know, acknowledging and sitting with it. And, and he even had to remind me, no, no, this, this really sucks. We, we can't change sure. that about, about it, you know? Um, so it has to be true. Uh, both versions have to be true. And then the final step, which is the most important is to tell it over and over again. And, and this takes work. So, this, what I've told you is very simple stuff. It's not rocket science. I'm no right. smarter than you. Right. Um, but step four takes, takes work. And I think is sometimes in the self-help industry, we can become complicit in helping people sort of rename and keep their problems. They're like, yeah, I've got a bad story. And then they move on, but they didn't actually do anything about that. They didn't rewrite the story. They felt better for a moment because they were able to title it something new. Um, you know, because telling yeah, people this does feel good. That's not, you know, it feels great just to identify, but you're not done yet. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's a be it's the beginning of the work, not the end. Right. And telling people like, well, this will take hard work over several months doesn't sell books, right? So <laughs> of oftentimes right. people don't right. don't put that right on the oh, cover. Oh, by the way, this is hard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is. So it is. Yes. <laughs> um, but yeah, so st step four, the most important part, and if you don't do this step, the rest of the work was for nothing, is to tell it over and over again and and implant that new story in your subconscious, such that whenever you're triggered um, about the the issue, like in my case, the issue of my mom, um, your old story is going to come up, you know, instantly that one's right, on right. active recall. You, you've had right. that one forever. And so you have to do the work to re-implant the new story in your subconscious so that it's the one that's triggered every time. And so that that's where the work comes in. It takes 30 days, minimum 60 to 90 days better. better. Um, and you have the, the, the main work is to tell it to yourself at least twice a day. So to, um, you know, tell it to yourself as soon as you wake up in the morning, tell it to right. yourself right before you go to bed again. Right. Uh, and then if you can't put it up somewhere in the house on your computer monitor or a mirror where you see it again. So you remember to tell yourself that story again. Right. And then a big part of the heavy lifting of that is to make it part of your lived oral tradition by sharing it with, with friends and family. So yeah. in my case, so once I went the story a lot, right. Yep. And you're telling it out loud uh, and you're right. sharing it with other people. So it becomes, you know, part of your lived experience, not right. just something that's, that's only internal. Right. And that's going to uh, get reflected back at you again through them. Right. Yep. So absolutely. They're know the new story and they're going to stop, start not, well, they didn't even know the new, the, the old story probably. Yeah, in large part, that's true. So, you know, after I rewrote my story, I would take people out to, you know, dinner or lunch and, I, and I'd right. tell them the story. I'd say, hey, I had this old story that was really making me suffer. And then I'd tell them the new story. Um, you, you know, the, I fought for my mom in every way I could while respecting her right to die her way. And by doing that over time, it became where anytime I was triggered about my mom's death, it's that new version of the story that, that came up. And once right. you get there, you know, you've, you've done the work. And, and if you fall off again, if you find that something can squeak through the filter, if something can trigger you, uh, Probably to get that old story that. up, <laughs> exactly right. Go back and, and do it over again and just keep telling it to yourself over and over again, because st stories are really the way we access the filter database and the programming of the brain. Like if you were to sit down at your computer right now to program a website, you wouldn't type in, make the background red, right? It wouldn't right. do it. <laughs> you, 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 you have to, to type learn the code. 
Yeah, you have to type something in HTML. So right. um, the the stories are the HTML for the brain. You wow, live most of your you, analogy. Yeah. Yeah, you live about 80% of your day on autopilot because your brain is the biggest energy hog organ we've got. Right. And so you'd have to sit around and eat as much food as an elephant if you were actively making every decision all day long. Right. So your brain creates really complex stories and filters to pattern your world so that you only have to really engage with the world about 20%. Wow. Um, and that's great if those stories and filters are taking you where you want to go. Right. But if not, nothing else gets through that's not pre-programmed into those filters. So to change your outcomes, you have to reach in there into that filter database and actually change those stories. And, and that's why story becomes such a powerful way to reprogram the brain. Wow. That's amazing. So uh, let's talk a little bit about like, so I know I went through some stuff. I think I, I told a story about like um, when I was a kid, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and I rewrote that story with my mom and my brother, right? So how do, how, it, do, you, how do you go about like just finding these stories? Yeah, yeah. The, uh, the, uh, like we talked about at the beginning of the story evolution process, the, the, the simple way to find these stories is just to think about an area of your life you're not happy right, with. Right, right. Gotcha. Um, and so uh, if you can think about an area of your life that you're struggling in, whether that be a relationship with a, a parent or a child, um, then, then once you've you know, realized I've got a problem with this part of my life, you just simply ask yourself those questions. Yeah. Um, you know, does, does the story, is the story true? And if, even if it's true, does the story serve me? Right. And that, uh, and it's good, it's good to reiterate that because that, that is the, the, the crux of the process is to take the time to discover those yeah. stories. Well, um, and they're, they're kind of like, you know, it's not like you're going to know those stories, just like you in the Costco parking lot, you know, you're not going to know the story. You're just going to know you're being bugged, right? Like this <laughs> relationship isn't working or I'm not, you know, I'm gaining weight. You're going to have a sign that that's going to point at a story, right? Something like that. Yeah. You know, Carl Jung said, until you make the unconscious conscious, it will direct your life and you will call it fate. Right. Yeah. So we're all, yeah, right. That's we're living smart. out, <laughs> yeah, we're living out these stories and we think this is just how our life is supposed to be. But in fact, we can be the active architect uh, of our own stories and right. in so doing become the active architect of an examined and intentional life, which is really the goal of all this, the, the finding the one story that's making you suffer, that sort of um, shows you the efficacy of the program, shows you that it works. That'll get you hooked on doing the work. Once you do that, you're going to want to do this for every bad story in your life, for every outcome in your life. And then as you put all that together, you suddenly have become the architect of your own, you know, examined and intentional life. You're going where you want to go. I, I, I taught Whitewater Guide School for, for 16 years. And I would give the kids these three mantras for learning to raft guide. And one of them was point where you want to go and get there. And the reason it was phrased <laughs> that way is because people sit in the boat and they hear the guide yells all forward. Like when you're, when you're a passenger, a guest, that's what you think the guy back there is just doing. He's just yelling all forward. Right. So people sit down and they just start yelling all forward and then they're not paying attention to where the front of the boat's pointing. So we end up, <laughs> you know, it is, it's hilarious. We slam into rocks, we eat the bushes, we end up on shore. Then we end up on the other shore. It's really entertaining for the instructors and very, very frustrating for the new guides. And so we teach them point where you want to go then get there. So you always point the bow of your boat to the direction you want to go before you initiate the momentum. So you want direction uh, right. before momentum and taking control of these stories gives you that direction before momentum. So In often the when, they would say all thrust, no vector. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You don't want exactly right. <laughs> Or like uh, in astronaut parlance, you know, the, the, your angle, like we teach people, one of the, one of the other um, mantras I teach the, the students is hard angle, start early. So you're driving a, a raft is not the same as driving a car because the road's moving too. It's constantly pushing you, you know, towards the obstacles. So uh, if you want to miss something that's a hundred yards down the way, you need to be setting your, your angle right now. Right. Uh, right. In astronaut parlance, they call your angle, you know, in relation to the horizon, your attitude. And, and I love that because our stories affect our attitude so right. much and, 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 and your attitude is going to affect your outcomes, uh, you know, and your angle here. So, um, teach, teaching people to get that, uh, that direction before momentum allows them to decide on a location to land, decide on an outcome that they want, and then craft their stories to take them to it. I just thought of a story that I was telling myself that I think I may have successfully rewritten. I want to, wow. uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> So as you were saying those other things, I had a little bit of an aha. So, um, 
Like, it's funny. So, like, I just went back to the office um, a couple days ago, and I noticed the sticky on my monitor in the office. And it was March uh, Dermatology, 17 March, 1400, right? So I used to be in the Air Force, so I write everything in military speak. So <laughs> that was the, the day that lockdown happened here in Vegas. And I had a oh, dermatology wow. appointment, right? So that dermatologist actually figured out a thing that I had that I had been struggling with uh, for like 15 years. <laughs> Nice. And I had gone to like, I lost count how many dermatologists I went to. Right. Wow. And nobody came up with anything other than lotion. All right. That was really frustrating. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I had this stuff. It was just like a rash. Right. But it would like come and go. Right. And when it came, it came bad. Right. And it, it was just gross. Okay, that's all. And it didn't even have a name. So I, I would go in, talk to the dermatologist. They maybe give me an ointment, but say, yeah, don't use it too much. It's got a steroid. It's got a bunch of bad effect. But when it's really itchy, you can use this. Things like that, right? <laughs> yeah. So I had kind of quit dermatologists. I was like, you know, they don't know what's going on, right? And that was the story that I told myself. And then, yeah, yeah. like, right before the lockdown, my parents came, and I was in the middle of a flare-up, right, in February of 20, right, right before the lockdown for COVID. Mm -hmm. And they're looking at my leg. They're going, you got to get that looked at. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, I know. Yeah, I've got an appointment, like, right after you guys leave. Um, I, I don't think they're going to do anything, but I have to go, Right. And I go, and the guy says, like, with he doesn't even look at it more than a minute. And he says, that's atopic dermatitis. Here's a sheet. Uh, you know, pay, pay on your way out. And, you know, he rewrote my story for me. <laughs> 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 but I believed it, right? And it, the thing was, was it wasn't just one thing. It was an ointment, a good one, right? But it was also, you just have, it, what it comes down to is I just have sent this sensitive skin. So you have, it's like you have to use the right kind of soap. You don't want to scrub on it. You can't use a loofah. I was doing all the wrong things, right? Yeah. So my story was horribly wrong <laughs> for skincare, <laughs> right? And he helped me rewrite it. And, and as you were saying that, I was like, that was, it literally changed my life. You don't know what it's like go, for going through 15 years of having a weird skin condition that creeps up every once in a while and makes you itch <laughs> it's it, scary and sad yeah and I, I think the great thing about that story is you, you, you had a, a brief interaction with a, a doctor you know and so uh same thing you can have a brief interaction with a mentor or a coach uh yeah and then they teach you what you need to 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 know or they help you unlock what's already inside you and then you're off right. on your own right so that like the idea in, in the work that i do with people is that uh, if I just teach you this once, you'll remember what it's like to feel this and you'll go out and you'll get after it yourself. You don't, you don't need me anymore. So right, the idea right, right. isn't to sort of have people, you know, coaching for the rest of their life, or even the people who go to therapy, going to therapy for the rest of their life. The, the That's idea good. is, is to help remind you that you already have all the tools inside you that you need. You already know how to do this. We just have to remind you, like, you know, Plato said, all learning is really remembering. We just need That's to true. unlock in you um, the, the, the components to make this happen. And then, then you're off to the races. You don't need me anymore. You don't need any more books. You don't need any more audio books. You don't need any more three-day programs. Uh, that, that's it. You, right, you know, you're, right. you're, you're your own teacher, you're your own healer, and you can get off, um, and, and get it done on your own. Um, and, and that's really the root of being stuck so often is people, they have these bad stories, they can't get past them. And then everything else in their life starts coming to this kind of grinding halt and they're still trying to have that momentum but they've right. lost all direction so they're still putting their pedal down as hard as they can <laughs> but but they don't know which they don't know which way to go anymore and and that's that's a really awful feeling and most of my yeah. clients when they come to me that's where they're at i'm I, i'm you know i'm stuck I don't like my job anymore or you know these relationships are frustrating like a lot of blaming like there's something wrong with you What's wrong with me? You start blaming yourself, right? Mm -hmm. And yep. that, that doesn't help. Yeah, it, it, yeah, or, yeah. Stressing about why, like stressing about right. why you're stressing, right? Like right. that, yes. that sort of thing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. And that's the, one of the, one of the sort of the differences in, in coaching in, in coaching and therapy is, you know, when therapy is backward looking, right. And, and coaching, I'm not here to heal what happened to you in the past. I'm here to help you pick a direction and move forward from this point. So if you right. need to heal what's in the past, then you need to go with somebody who has more letters behind their name than me. That's not <laughs> correct. Uh, I, 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 I'm here yes. to, to help you pick a point and, and move forward from it. Um, you know, and it also is a very, uh, it is a very momentum based process. So we're not, we're trying to help you, uh, get going again. And, and that's, and that's it. And, and we're not trying to get stuck in the process of the process. We're trying to give you the tools you need to, to pick a new direction and, and get moving again, because a lot of, um, a lot of frustration in, in humans is in not having progress and not having momentum. If you find somebody that feels like they're going nowhere, that's somebody that's, that's suffering. Um, and, and so, and so often successful, happy people take a hit in life. And because they've been successful, happy people, they maybe haven't had to develop the skills to recover from that hit and get their direction back and then, then start charging again. And so that's where things like the story evolution process, um, you know, and getting some coaching help it gets people um, the skill set they need to then do it themselves and rock and roll. No, I love it. It's great. It kind of reminds me of, have you ever heard of this app Noom? They talk a lot about the, the psychology stuff, but it's mostly just like, it's because they're in your face every day <laughs> for like four months or something, uh, you know, on your phone. So it's app based, but app based coaching, really gentle. Anyway, sorry, I'm plugging Noom now. It's, it's about <laughs> you. <laughs> it's no, but, similar, uh, though. It's, it's cognitive therapy based, I think. Yeah. Any, anything that is focused on helping you develop skills. Cause so, so much yeah, of the right. frustration or anxiety that comes with feeling stuck or feeling depressed is not knowing when it will end, not knowing how to make it end, not feeling in control. So yeah. it's uh, like you feel like me with my, my rash, it's like, I got nowhere to go. Right. I feel powerless. Yeah. And one of the core components in happiness is locus of control, whether you believe things are happening to you or whether you believe you are making things happen. And so you're said to have an external locus of control. If you feel like you're sort of a victim and everything's happening to you right. and, and you're, you're said to have an internal locus of control, if you feel like you're making things happen. And when you, you take a hit like that and your emotions you get pushed and now you're experiencing what are normal human emotions, right. but in a heightened way, you start to get into that cycle of what's wrong with me? Why can't I fix this? What's going on? And then that that locus of control shifts to the external because you're you're feeling like you're being victimized by your own emotions, um, and and so taking an active role in rewriting your stories, even rewriting your stories about those emotions. Like, yes, I'm feeling this, uh, but it's normal. It's okay. It's part of the process. Right. E even rewriting those stories helps you shift that locus of control back to the internal. Helps move your happiness preset a little bit. Helps you take control back, um, because you know, as we uh, we may have been talking about before, um, it might have been uh, you know off record here, but uh, happiness really um, is better living through chemistry and not the chemistry that comes in the in a pill bottle, right. you know, or, yeah. or in a shot glass. Not um, beer, but not heroin. <laughs> yeah, it's it's better living through neurochemistry, and right. so. You, there are predictable things you can do to create the proper neurochemical environment in your brain to yep. create a resilient form of, of happiness. Uh, you know, again, we're not talking about this sort of like life's all unicorn and rainbows, giggling idiot all the time. Nobody's happy all the time. That's okay. Um, right. Aristotle called it eudaimonia, human flourishing. It's a sort of you know, resilient sense of well-being and moving forward in life um, is really what you're looking for in happiness. And that has gotten through doing the right things to create the right neurochemical environment. Um, right. And in and, and the book, I teach four of them that I call the core four oh, nice. that work synergistically to help people create that. Um, and, and they're basically getting, you know, eight hours of sleep a night, doing 30 to 45 minutes cardiovascular exercise, um, doing at least 10 minutes of mindfulness and meditation a day awesome. um, and doing a daily gratitude practice. Um, that's but a these, good core four. That's a, <laughs> yeah. um, that's a good core four. That's good. Yeah. And it's not another morning routine. If you have a morning routine, you can incorporate these in. You're probably doing some of these already. Right. Um, but they have, they have powerful, um, you know, neurological and neurochemical, you know, um, reasons behind them. Like yeah. if you miss a, a night of sleep, it, it disconnects your medial prefrontal cortex from your amygdala. So your amygdala mm -hmm. is, is the, uh, anger center of your brain, you know, right? Like, so that's your, wow. that's your, that's your, uh, buddy who's, you know, always taking one too many Jaeger bombs and ready to punch somebody out at the bar. That's, <laughs> that's your amygdala, right? 
<laughs> and you're, That's a you're good pre- picture that you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and your your prefrontal cortex is like your mild mannered accountant buddy Chip who taps that guy in the leg and says, "Don't don't punch him. He's not a bad guy, right?" Yeah, he, so he, it, he's our asshole. Don't don't hit. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So if you miss one night of sleep, Chip's not invited to the party. You get ah. a, a, a prefrontal cortex amygdala disconnect, and you have about a sixty percent higher um, anger response to negative stimuli. Wow. So, so you can imagine what that does to all your relationships, whether that's at work or with your kids or with your wife or your husband, right. you, a, any small stimulus, you're getting 60% more anger associated with it. Um, so getting you know as close to eight hours of sleep as you can a night really helps um, keep your emotional resilience in the brain. It keeps your checks and balances that are already built in connected and working. Right. And then the 30 to 45 minutes cardiovascular exercise, that's a really powerful antidepressant. It it, Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it dumps dopamine and serotonin into your system. The Duke Smile studies found that that it's uh, equal to taking Zoloft. So they had one group taking Zoloft and one group doing 45 minutes of exercise. They had equal rates of reduction in diagnoses of major depression in both groups. Um, I I, I would rather have the cardio. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, Cardio does, doesn't have as many downsides. Yeah, no side effects, no side right? Effects, yeah, right. <laughs> Except maybe, maybe your clothes maybe fitting better. Sore knees. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I should be clear. You know, if, if you're if you're really suffering with depression, you're thinking about harming yourself. Going for a jog isn't going to cut it. You, right. you, 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 you know, you owe it to yourself. Now. Yeah, yeah, you owe it to yourself and your family to make a call right now and get help for that. But. For a general long-term happiness tune-up or dealing with a general case of the Mondays or the pandemic blues, right. um, exercise is a really powerful antidepressant. Yep. So now you, if you're just doing those two things, you're getting eight hours of sleep and you're getting exercise, you've now reduced your anger response and increased the amount of happiness chemicals in your brain. So you can see right. already you're halfway there to, to, to being much, much happier, more emotionally resilient. Um, now, mindfulness is great. Not only helps you pattern your world for the positive and gives your brain a break from uh, sort of the speed of the day, but it is something else more interesting, um, which is it works on the amygdala over time. So long-term meditators, we find that the, the well, I, I say we, we, I am not a neuroscientist, but the, the, the royal we of people who research neuroscience find uh, that it thins out the tissue in the amygdala. So when you get a, a, a negative stimuli, your ang- the, the amount of tissue in your brain working on your anger response is actually thinned out. So you have a less dense mass of tissue to light up and work on negative stimuli, which is which is pretty amazing. So that sort of serene sense you get from your friends who are really consistent meditators, that's because they've actually functionally changed the structures in their brain that respond to negative stimuli. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It works. Yeah. I've been, it, it, I've been doing mindfulness practice for a long time. It takes a long time, but yeah, you're right. I've noticed the difference. <laughs> yeah, it's really powerful it's over huge. longer periods. You can get yep. you can get some instant relief from it, you know, right away. But then these these sort of bigger structural changes that happen no over time are really amazing. Physically, has been measured to change the brain like that. That's amazing. That's oh yeah, all new information yeah, all sorts of things. Me. Yeah, yeah. They also find um, much much lower rates of dementia um, in in elderly well, patients that have been lifelong meditators. Um, the ones that haven't. So it do, does all kinds of really interesting things. Well, in the doesn't brain. it also like uh, reduce levels of cortisol in the moment and throughout the day too? The stress mm-hmm. hormone. Yep. It, it, yeah, it can right. do all of that, and it, it also helps your brain. One one of the reasons you know we didn't really talk about this earlier, but one of the reasons your brain uh, is sort of pre-wired to write such bad stories uh, is because we have a survival-based right. brain. Right. Um, right. And so our, our brains are really good at looking for what's the next thing that's going to kill me and being afraid of that. Right, right. Uh, it, we're all flashing back to when we were evolutionary about to get eaten by a lion. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly right. right and right. Now, now that there's not a lion in the bushes, then what, what our brains look for is, is negativity. So right. as we're talking right now, you're taking in about 11 million, or you're being bombarded really with about 11 million bits of information. And wow. you can actively take in 40 to 60 of them, depending on the study that, that you read. Okay. And you, your brain and your filtering system is already set up to make those the most negative bits of information. Now you compile your stories from the information you're taking in. So right. you've got you've got a brain and a set of filters that's meant to bring in the worst bits of information, and then you're left to build stories out of really terrible bits of information. Wow. And so meditation yeah. combined with a daily gratitude practice 
helps you pattern your world for the positive. So by, by writing down at least once a day, three things you're grateful for more is better. Of course, um, you are giving your brain more positive bits of information to begin to compile your stories. Mm. And then if you take the time to sit with each of those three things you wrote down that you're grateful for, and like, you know, if you said, I'm grateful for having a healthy body today, mustering up the actual feeling, trying to spend 10 to 30 seconds feeling grateful for that right. on each of those things, you're going to attach the emotion to uh, the, the positive bits of inf information that will help you, um, be a better, uh, patterner of the world, create filters that are looking more often for positive right. bits inf of information and less often for negative bits. Yeah. That's amazing. That's, that's probably the most scientific, uh, explanation I've heard of the benefits of a, a mindfulness practice. So, ah, you're giving away free coaching here. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, 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 that's the goal. Listen to the podcast, get better today. That's, that's what we're, that's what we're after. <clears throat> this has been a blast, Rich. Um, so talk a little bit about how people can best get in touch with Rich Curtis at richcurtis.com. Yeah, you can, you can pop over to the website, richcurtis.com, see everything we're, we're up to. Uh, you know, uh, we, we do uh, individual one-on-one -on -one coaching, group coaching. Um, you can also, if you just want to dive into the science of this and the system of it and start rewriting your stories and, and get better right now, you can go to Amazon and search Change Your Story, Change Your Life, Rich Curtis. Wow. And you can find the, the, the book there um, in, in all three formats, you know, ebook, um, physical book, and audio book read by me. Um, and so you can, you can grab it there, um, and get started on, on that work, uh, today, if you'd like. That's perfect. So thank you. Sorry for the audio issues. I think <laughs> no problem. Th I, thanks I, for having me. It was a good conversation. I think your, your son was right. I'm going to blame zoom and Trump. <laughs> I'll get in trouble perfect. for the Trump, uh, comment. I'm sure. <clears throat> that's, <yeah. laughs> I just, that's um, my new joke for 2021. Everything's Trump's fault. So that's, it's, it's not it's perfect. Just me screwing up my recorder or anything else. All right. <laughs> <laughs> thanks Rich. No. You have a good yeah. one. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Nice to meet you, Jeff. All right. Talk to you later. Bye. Bye. Thanks for taking the time to ride along with us on another episode of Vroom Vroom Veer. For podcast info and show notes, be sure to head over to vvveer.com. That's triple V double -E E-R.com. Man, that's fun to say. And we'll catch up with you next time here on Vroom Vroom Veer.